Well, staff, thank you for joining us once again today, where today my very special guest is Richard Rodriguez. And this is from the series of interviews I'm doing with people. I'm calling it Carnivore Stories, people telling us how they came across the carnivore diet, when they came across the carnivore diet, why they changed to it, what were they experiencing, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, what was going on. Richard's story is one of those that you may have heard before if you're uh, if you're a devotee of Joey's channel, which you should be. Um, believe it or not, Richard has been apparently eating a carnivore diet for over four decades. Is that right, Richard? Actually, it's been since 1983, so it'll be 39 years. Ah, nearly then. Ah. Oh, we'll come back next year, and then we'll we'll do the interview then, when it is over. But anyway, I tell you what: thirty nine years, forty years. What's a year between friends? That's incredible, um, because we've always got people on the other side of the fence who are saying to us things like, "Wow, well, shame with someone that's been doing that for a long time." Well, there you go. Everybody, meet Richard. Thirty nine years on the carnivore diet. Um, tell us about it, Richard. How did you come across it? What on earth made you start doing that all those years ago? Um, what was your experience with it? Basically, broadly, tell us your story. Well, it started when I was a teenager. Um, I was one of those kids that was quite short and thin, and I got picked on a lot. So I was trying to look for a way to put on some weight, maybe get bigger, you know, build some muscle, whatever. So I was always told that the best way to do that is to, you know, you need to eat a lot and you need to eat a lot of uh, potatoes and rice and pasta and all those things. So I figured, well, let me try and see what happens. But then the one thing that they used to give me, which I absolutely hated, was this terrible drink called Ovaltine. Mm. It was foul, disgusting, I, ugh, awful. And then they would give me oatmeal in the morning and, you know, but the biggest problem I had is that my parents at the time were somewhat into health food and they were told that it was bad to give too much fat or too much meat. They said that, uh, you know, meat can cause cancer and when you get older, you're going to have heart disease and all these things. And I was told by my, my mom that when I was younger, I was starting to get kind of big and they were afraid that I was going to get fat. So they said, give him skim milk and don't give him too much meat. So that's kind of how it started. But my diet actually started when I was going from junior high to high school. And what happened was I was helping my dad build a carport. I fell through the roof. I broke my arm. And I was stuck at home for part of the summer. And my mother would work. My dad would work. So I was kind of by myself. So it came to the point where I had to figure out what I could eat. And, you know, cooking has never really been one of my strong points, especially as a kid. So I always liked meat. So I thought, well, you know, I could just cook meat and eat that, and maybe a few vegetables. And that's it. It's just so much simpler. And I started to eat like that. And then I got, I've always liked meat. I'm one of those kids that never liked candy or cookies or any, I don't even like bread, bread. I just, I never liked it. It's like when I was younger, my parents used to give me a peanut butter and jelly sandwich, which I hate jelly. I don't mind the peanut butter, but I don't like bread. So I'd give it to the ducks outside the school. You'd fallen through a roof, you're broken, your arm, you have to be at home for the summer. Um, right. Yeah. So what I started doing, I started eating mostly meat. And, you know, as a kid, I had been given a lot of different foods, but meat has always been my favorite. And my favorite meat has always been beef for some strange reason. You know, I've always liked steak. I've even liked ground beef. But my mom was Hungarian, so she would make a goulash, which is like beef with vegetables and some other things, which I used to, I still like to this day. So that was always my favorite food. Okay. And it's almost as if um, people have been eating beef largely for, you know, a very, very long time, or at least large large ruminants uh, of that kind. And, and so that's no real surprise that you might have a genetic um, desire for that. 
What about the sort of desire, if there was one, for vegetables, fruit, all that kind of stuff? Talk to us a little bit about that. Believe it or not, I don't really like vegetables. Um, I used to force myself to eat them. Sometimes my mother would give me Brussels sprouts, which I I used to throw those to the ducks. Um, I just, you know, I I do, I did enjoy broccoli, but only when it was cooked with beef. Um, I'm not really into salad. I just, I don't know, vegetables didn't excite me. And I don't like corn and I don't like rice. I just, there's a lot of things I don't like. And pasta, I don't like that either. The okay. only type of fruit that I do like, and I still sometimes eat to this day, would be bananas because I grow them myself. I like tomatoes because it's good for cooking with meat. And, you know, other than that, not really a vegetable or fruit person. I may eat some citrus once in a while. I take sour oranges and marinate meat with it. That's about it. Okay. So no fiber in your diet to speak of? Not much. <laughs> All right. So clearly then in that case, you haven't been to the bathroom in nearly 40 years. <laughs> yeah. I usually go only two or three times a day. Right. <sighs> okay. And obviously, about 39 years ago, 38 and a half, maybe, clearly you died of scurvy at that point, and no one's had the heart to tell you about it? <laughs> yeah, I guess so. Mm. I guess I'm not here anymore. I guess it's still 1983. Yep, must be, must be. And the other thing that, that will probably strike the viewers quite a bit is if... I could be so rude, Richard, as to say to you, how old are you? 54. There you go, boys and girls. Do you believe that for a second? It's almost as if Richard's been living a nutritional lifestyle that is indicated and appropriate for our species for the vast majority of his time on the planet, and it's agreed with him in some way. Sure looks like it. Surely does, doesn't it? So what I mean, what do you say to I mean well first of all, let's 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 pose it this way. Have you had much pushback from people over the years? Have people because I mean the thing is that opinions are a bit like rear ends, aren't they? Most people have got one and mostly they're full of stuff, shall we say. Um I've encountered a lot of resistance. Okay, tell us about it. First from my parents, but you know, I had my doubts in the beginning, but the reason that I continued the diet is because when I started, which was in 1983, I was very short and thin. I started to grow at a rate that is just, I, I couldn't even believe it. I went from being one of the shortest boys in school to the second tallest by the time I finished high school. I don't know if it was a diet or what it was, but all I know is that I felt good and I just kept growing. So I thought, you know what, I'm going to keep eating this way. But eventually, I did sort of succumb to the pressure. In 1980, well, it was 1992, we had a hurricane, and I had so much meat because everybody was, they, they had to get rid of their food, and I was the only one that had a generator. So I, was, I ate nothing but meat from Hurricane Andrew until the end of 1992. But then a lot of people I knew, they were trying to scare me. They were telling me that my colon cancer risk was high, I was going to get heart disease, and all these things. So I agreed to try a vegetarian diet starting in January of 1993. But I lasted until about July when I got a really bad flu. I was the sickest I'd ever been in my life. And the first thing I ate after that was eggs. You know, I walked outside, I saw a nest of duck eggs, I ate that. And the next thing I ate, I drove to the store, I got ground beef and I cooked that. And after that, I started feeling better. And just, it seemed like once I started eating the meat again, it just got better and better and better. Within three days, I felt fine. Incredible. Yeah. It's, again, it's almost as if it's the right diet for a human being. And it's species appropriate, species specific. It's what your genes have, it's the, you know, the lines along which your genes have developed. And as such is absolutely the best thing for you to do for your health, both short term and long. 
All right. Sorry about that. No problem. Have you got a dimmer so switch? We're having a storm, and I think every time the lightning hits, it does something weird to the phones around here. Ah, okay. Could be that too. All right. Well, sometimes a dimmer switch will do that. It'll be sending out air. You know, that's true. Mm. I, I know those have SCRs in them, and they actually can create oscillations. Yeah, yeah. Anyway, we're on top of it. We're uh, we're taking care of it to bring the news to you, boys and girls. And the news is four decades, pretty much, with a with a six month or so break in between there to have some vegetables for a while, which only actually messed your health up. Incredible. That's right. Mm. I was amazed at what happened. In fact, that after that, I vowed I would never ever try a vegetarian experiment again. And I even told my parents and other people I knew. I said, look, if this diet is going to kill me. I'd rather die quick than have to suffer the rest of my life trying to live a few years longer and end up weak and sick and like, nope, nope. I'd rather die of a heart attack and get it over with. Right. So, however, though, it does seem like, you know, that we're still waiting for this heart attack 40 years later. Have you, have you well, had, you know, it's Go on. Well, but the thing is, I, I may be very sick and don't know it because I haven't been to a doctor since 1996. But and that was because the doctor was trying to scare me. They I had I changed health plans. They did a blood test and they said my cholesterol was too high. Mm -hmm. And that they're asking me, what do I eat? I said, well, I cook everything in beef tallow. I eat a lot of beef. Sometimes I eat pork. Rarely I eat chicken. Oh, you should eat more white meat chicken. You need to lower the cholesterol. I said, okay, then what's the risk? He said, well, you get heart disease and obesity. I said, well, if my diet is so bad, why are you obese and I'm skinny? And then that, after that, he got offended. And <laughs> <laughs> That's a pretty good comeback. Uh, it's the sort of thing I would say. Yeah, fair <laughs> idea. That's it, though. I mean, you know, that that's one example of how you might deal with someone with, with some of these, frankly, silly ideas that they have. Um, uh, that answers my my next question about you know whether or not you've you've had much recent work done in terms of things like bloods or any of that kind of thing that might give us an idea about some of your health um, indicators, shall we say? So not so much. No, and the other thing, I've had a couple of side effects of this diet. One thing that happened to me when I started it, I was no longer bitten by mosquitoes, and now they don't bother. I haven't had. When I was young, I used to get stung by the mosquitoes. I'd get bumps and itch. But since the 1980s, they don't bother me. If they do bite me, I wouldn't know it because they don't leave any kind of bump or anything like that. And the other thing is I don't get sunburn anymore. I work outside most of the time. The last time I got sunburn, I think, was in 1983. Mm. Yeah. There is a, an idea floating around that people are talking about when you are consuming a lot of polyunsaturated fatty acids, which are ostensibly found um, in relatively high amounts in plant materials and in, in industrial seed oils that they're telling us that we should substitute animal fat for because they're so much you know healthier for us and all of that. There's an idea that these polyunsaturates are um, becoming part of the of the matrix of the makeup of our cell membranes and that they're conformationally a different shape and it as such it's that which seems to be predisposing us to sunburn as um as people eat more and more and more of this stuff more and more and more sunburn seems to be accruing so that's an interesting one that you would point to that one and say that you you know you you've just noticed that you've stopped uh, you've stopped getting sunburned sort of thing. Um, so th it's not like there was any huge change in solar activity around 1983 or anything like that. If anything, we're, we're told that, you know, the sun is, is more and more dangerous every year, not less and less. So I guess that's that's an interesting anecdote as well. Um, all right. So some other anecdotes or stories about you know amusing ways that you've dealt with people who have wanted to ram their opinion and or some vegetables down your throat well the other thing they told me when i was younger if i ate too much fat i was going to get acne mm -hmm. i was going to have a breakout and i was the only kid my age that never got acne at all i mean when i went through puberty i, I didn't even get a single pimple so 
that was the other thing. See, the, everything they told me didn't make sense. What they were telling me what happened is not what happened. So it just, I got to the point where I was thinking, well, maybe they're just lying to me. They're just telling me information that doesn't mean anything. Mm-hmm. And it is. And then the thing is, I was telling everyone, I said, look, if the diet was so bad, I would have problems. I mean, I mean, obviously, my, my teeth are a mess because I got into a lot of fights as a kid, and they're crooked probably from the diet I had before. But I haven't been to a dentist since 1986, and I've never had a cavity. Yeah. And I don't brush my teeth very often either, mm. which is another thing. I said, well, if you don't brush your teeth all the time, they'll fall out. Yeah. But, but I don't. Mm. Yeah, I find the same thing. Um, I still brush daily because it's a habit and whatever, but you don't get on the carnival diet. You don't get that furry teeth thing that you, you get when you've got all that sugar-loving bacteria growing on your teeth. Um, and those it's those bacteria that exude acid onto the enamel of your teeth, and that's what causes tooth um, cavities to occur. Um, so, yep, absolutely. That's in line as well with, with what we what we now know. So um, we've dealt with fiber. We've dealt with vitamin C. Um, we've dealt with teeth brushing, um, sunburn. What else could you point us to? Well, that's a good question. The only thing that I know is that out of all the friends that I have, I'm the only one that doesn't have any medications. I'm not on any pharmaceuticals. I've never been on an antibiotic either. And I work outside. I've cut myself many times. I've had times where I cut my hand and I had to stitch it myself. And I just, I don't seem to get infections. Um, I got COVID three times and it was very minor. It was not a problem. Mm. So, and again, if my diet was so deficient in vitamins, why am I not in the hospital? Why am I not really sick? Mm. Exactly. No people that take vitamin supplements, I don't. I take no supplements. Excellent. Okay. And if it's not a rude question, you don't dye your hair, do you? What's that? You don't dye your hair. No, no, no. Of course not. No, my hair is natural. I don't even have any gray hair. It's not dyed. I mean, even the facial hair, it's all still dark. In your mid-50s, no gray hair. No. Interesting, isn't it? Yep. Can't see one. I don't have any gray hair. Yeah. Also, I mean, yeah. I, maybe maybe when I get older, of course, I'll get some, but maybe I haven't had it. Maybe you won't, because I mean, I, I I would I think we would struggle to find another person. I mean, I'm sure there might be, but we might struggle to find another person that's been on as close to 100 percent carnivorous diet for as anything like as long, um, as you know, nearly four decades, for goodness' sake. And, you know, you, you look at your skin, for example, and you go, well, you know, this is not a man in his mid-50s. You look at your hair and you go, no, this is not a man in his mid-50s. Your, your general deportment um, and all of that and and, this, and the anecdotes that you're telling us about your, your health, which sounds like it's, you know, robust. You're in rude health, basically. Um, people might say, oh, yeah, that's just your genetics, though. That's, just, you know, you've just been lucky sort of thing. Let's well, have a look at it. Like- if it's, if it's my genetics, my dad had more problems at my age than I do. There you go. So I don't think it's just genetics. There you go. So in your extended family, are there health problems at large? I mean, you don't have to give us anyone's particular details, but I mean, are there, is everybody in as rude health as you are? Do you all just have good genes or? Uh, mm, yes and no. I mean, my grandfather lived to 94. But my dad only lived to 82. My mom lived to 90. But both of my parents, they suffered from anemia. And I think that's what eventually, my mother especially, that's what got her. You know, her blood count was always low. I kept telling my mom, if you would just eat more beef, you wouldn't have a problem. They had to give her those iron supplements. Yeah. And I said, well, those, those are iron oxide. They're not going to do anything. You need to eat more meat, you know, get the right type of iron. But my mom hated meat. She just didn't like steak. She could barely eat hamburgers. Beef was not her thing. And see, she was Hungarian, and they ate a lot of meat over there, but she didn't like meat. And when she was young, they used to give her liver as a way to try to cure the anemia, but she would give it to the cat. That's what she told me. Yeah. 
Okay. Now, I like liver. I actually do enjoy it. Fair enough. Fair enough. I must say, I don't eat a lot of liver myself, none at all, pretty much to speak of, actually. And it's just because I actually don't like it. And there are some potential issues, maybe, for people who might be eating tons and tons of liver, like too much. Um, right. We're not sure on that. I don't, I don't eat a lot of it. Once mm. in a while, when it's on sale, I will buy it. A lot of times, what I'll do, I'll mix it with ground meat and I'll make a stew with yep. it. Yeah. Um, that's how I like it. Okay, fair enough. Fair enough. We won't we won't take your carnival card off you for that. I think I think you've earned it over you know nearly four decades. Incredible. Um, where have you been hiding, Richard? Why have we never heard? I mean, because there's there's this huge um, online burgeoning community now of 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 us who have taken up the carnivore diet in the last. Well, in my case, about seven and a half years ago. Kelly Hogan is up to about 12 years, um, 10 years or so for the Petersons, about the same for Dr. Sean Baker, um, a bit longer than that from Dr. Anthony Chafee, for example. Where have you been? Where have you been hiding? Why have we never heard of you? Well, it's I wasn't even aware that this diet was a thing. I had no idea. It wasn't until we had the COVID lockdown where I... I couldn't work. I had to sit at the computer. I started looking at videos. And I remember the first video that I saw was, I believe it was, it was either Saladino or Baker. It was one of the two. And I was looking at this and you're talking about eating only meat. And I thought, that's the way that I eat. I thought that was bad. But then there's all the benefits of low carb. And then I, I saw this keto, which I'd never heard of. I didn't know what keto was. I always remember the Atkins diet when I was a kid. You know, you had Dr. Atkins. He said, oh, that's the diet you want to get if you want to get heart disease and yeah. die. Yeah. But, but the funny thing is, until 2020, I didn't know there was a carnivore community or keto diet or anything like that. So I had the time to go online. I started looking, and I tried to contact some of these people. But these uh, carnivore promoters, they, they never contacted me back or anything. It was actually just a couple of weeks ago, Joey, that had seen, I had made a comment about what I like to eat, how I like to eat iguana and duck and stuff like that. He says, oh, I want to interview. I said, oh, that's an interesting idea. I thought about it. I said, oh, why not? So I wasn't even aware that this existed. Mm -hmm. You know, when I had my YouTube channel years ago, it was about antique cars because I'm a big fan of Dodge Chargers. You know, that's you know, my favorite car. I have a few and that's just a little model but that's what it was that's where the channel name came from and then i also did work with alternative energy i had a truck that ran on wood so i had several youtube channels i got into a controversy with a couple of other people i had my channel taken down then when my parents became elderly i had to take care of them for almost 10 years so i didn't even pay attention to youtube but my mom passed away and then we had the the covid and it just kind of pulled me into it. All right. So how have you found it? Have you enjoyed being interviewed a couple of times by various different people with, you know, different aspects of it, different views on it, perhaps? Is it something you feel like you are likely to continue doing more interviews? How does that sit? Yeah, I was, I was surprised that anybody would be interested when Joey did his interview. I was very surprised at how many people had commented on the video and all the positive comments that they had, because I've been pretty much made fun of for years for the way that I eat. They, they laugh at me, you know, oh, it's Rick. All he wants to do is eat meat all the time. I said, well, you know, what's wrong with meat? Well, you have to eat other things. You can't just eat meat only. No, but I feel good on meat, but I had no idea that there were other people who are doing it. And the other thing is that since I've been looking at some of these uh, carnivore channels, I've referred it to a couple of my friends. And I have two friends now that have switched to a low carb diet and they're both losing weight. And that's something they could never do. You know, they were just struggling all the time and starving and trying to cut calories and exercise and getting injured. And, you know, it said, oh, this is so simple. And, and my one friend says, I should have eaten like you years ago. I didn't know that it was this powerful. So, yeah, I mean, if I can help other people, that's great. Yeah, well, I, I, I think that 
you know, if nothing else, and there will be other things, but if nothing else, the fact that you've been doing this for as long as you have, I think is a very, very powerful message for people who might just have that lingering doubt. Oh, yes, but is there any long-term safety data here? Is there anyone that's been doing this for more than about 10 or 12 years? And now we can say, yes, yes, there is. And his name is Richard Rodriguez. 40 years next year. Incredible. Take out that six months in the middle, sure, as as an experiment. Um, well, I think everyone goes through a vegetarian or vegan phase if they're having problems. But mm. I'm a little unique because most of, most of the people that I've seen that have testimonials, they were sick at one time or they had major problems. And then they switched to a keto or carnivore diet. A lot of them went to keto first and then carnivore. To me, it was just something that came natural. I was not trying. I didn't have any problems, really, I mean, other than being small. I, I've never had the aches and pains or the suffering. I mean, it's very rare that I would get sore. You know, like a few weeks ago, I was picking up an engine block, and then, you know, I, my arms hurt the next day. I mean, that's just from the exertion. Mm. But the other thing that people are amazed is how flexible I am. I'm able to get down, squat down, you know, work on things. I sit down sometimes for 10, 15 minutes just on my feet on the floor and then stand up and move around. And they say, well, how can somebody as tall as you be able to do that? I said, oh, if I did that, I would be in pain. I said, well, me? I have no problem. I don't even think about it. Mm, mm. Well, it's, okay. It just comes natural. Maybe because you started the carnivore diet at such a tender young age that you didn't have the time to really do the damage to yourself that most of us did. Um, remind us, what age were you when you started this way of eating? I was about 15. Yeah. So, incredible, incredible story. Um, basically, what what you're telling us is in line with what we already know, absolutely have no doubt about on the basis of really, you know, 10 or 12 years of experience that we can rely upon the, the people that we know. And now we can add you to, the, to our posse, if you like. You can be in our club of carnivores. You should probably be the president, frankly, because you'd be the longest standing. Um, you know, and it's just yet more grist for our mill, if you will excuse the... Sorry, guitar falling over in the background there. <laughs> um, grist for our mill, um, you know, to, to, point, to point people towards yet more examples of people who have eaten a species-appropriate, species-specific diet, that which we know absolutely to be true. Uh, in Richard's case, for coming up, for four decades. I want to thank you so much for your time today, Richard. It's been absolutely um, incredible to hear about um, the very, very real benefits that this diet has um, accrued to you over basically a lifetime so far. Um, may that life extend for at least as long again, and it probably will, I would suspect, because of the very uh, the very manner in which you have lived thus far it will probably you know it will probably accrue you that sort of benefit and um yep uh, yep so just thank you for that and i'm just blown away really by uh, by the um well the fact that you would be so unassuming and it was like oh this is just how i've eaten for 40 years it's no big deal well yeah it is it is this is a very very powerful thing that's true. But, you know, there's one other benefit to this. I never knew that I wasn't the only one. And now that I've seen some of the other people that are doing it, it's a whole different community than, let's say, the vegan or vegetarian community. They seem to be in a competition and they're very easily offended because I've had to have conversations with a few that I know. And they they just I don't know how to describe it, but they will do whatever it takes to try to make you feel bad. But with this group of keto and carnivore people, it seems to be more like an encouragement. They're mm. saying, well, you know, you're making progress good. You know, I'm doing this and this is working for me. And it's, it's just like more of a team rather than a competition. Yeah, sure. Um, pretty much that's how we feel about it. We are here to support each other. Um, 
I, of course, have taken the role as as the senior academic, if you like, in the in the department, and I've taken the role of correcting people who say things that are wrong and being, you know, oh, I'm going to point out everyone's flaws and faults and all that kind of stuff. Um, you know, but I, there are other people out there as well who are entirely um, positive and supportive of whatever people are doing. There's space for that too. Um, yeah. It's a great, it's a great community. It's a great thing to be a part of. Welcome to it. As I say, you should be its founding member and president, probably. What with your with your length of time that you've been doing this. Once again, thank you for your valuable time, um, and thank you for doing this quite late at night. Clearly, where you are. Um, no problem. That's oh, that's another thing I forgot to mention. I have no trouble going to sleep, and I never use an alarm clock. Right. So even if I go to bed a little later, I'm always up at eight. Right. Awesome. And you know, sleep like a baby by the by the uh, the sounds of it. Um, I, I have no trouble sleeping, and uh, that's another thing. I have another friend of mine that just went to the doctor. They had to give him, I think, uh, some kind of CPAP test because he wakes up at night mm, all the time. Yeah, and he's a little heavy, and I think that it interferes with the breathing. Mm. Yep, absolutely. Right there, you go. There you have it in a nutshell, boys and girls. Let's call it forty years of being on a carnivore diet, haven't died of scurvy, hasn't been constipated for 40 years, hasn't got heart Never. disease, hasn't got colon cancer, um, isn't obese, doesn't have diabetes, doesn't have a single grey hair on his head or in his eyebrows or, or anywhere, hardly a wrinkle in his mid-50s, strong, robust, flexible, tall, it's all there, boys and girls. It's all there for you. Take that to to be of whatever value it is to you. Um, and the next time one of these vegans tells you, no, absolutely, you can't do that long term, it'll kill you, just give them the URL for this video and say, well, check this one out. Here's, here's at least N equals one. And I think as, as we progress down the line, there'll be more and more people with similar sorts of you know, periods of time without eating, you know, largely, if not entirely, carnivorous diets. And I think we'll find that these anecdotes will all add up over time to become overwhelming evidence of what we've been saying on the basis of looking at our physiology and our anthropology and our organ systems and our DNA and all of that. So, Richard, thank you so much. I appreciate it. We'll let you get, uh, we'll let you get off to sleep and... Um, We'll see you around the traps, perhaps for a live question and answers session, even if you're if you're brave enough, keen enough for that. I look forward to it. All right, I'll have my people call your people. These are my people. You've probably not met him before. His name is Lord Edward Yellow, otherwise known as Yellow Ted, who is an absolute expert in camouflage, among uh -oh. other things. Yes, he's also a disciplinarian, and he's the one that uses much much of the bad language on my channel. Um, that's why he's been <laughs> gagged. He's not allowed anymore. Well, that's that's like like here. I have a flock of ducks outside, so you know I always use that as everything around here is has a duck theme to it. I have all kinds of excellent stuff, stuff ducks and duck figurines and everything. Very good, very good. All right, as I say, I'll let you get off to sleep. Thank you very much, and uh, yes, we will see we'll see you very soon for a live questions and answers session because I'm sure that many of my followers, subscribers, and supporters would love to rack your brain and, and find out more of your experiences than we can do here in a short interview. So we'll see you then. Sounds good. All right. Ciao for now. Ciao.